Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, notes, there we go. Welcome everybody. Um, good afternoon. Thanks for joining us. This is the lunchtime lecture series from the Fort Worth Botanic Garden and the Botanical Research Institute of Texas. Uh, I'm Dr. Brooke Best, Director of Research Programs, and I and my research colleagues host this lecture series, which takes place the first Tuesday of each month, um, noon central, almost always. Viewers today, you'll, you'll uh, be muted throughout the lecture, but you can type your questions in the chat at any time, and we'll go over them at the end during the Q&A. And if you want to test out the chat now, we usually do this. Uh, we ask you to, you know, tell us where you're watching from today. Uh, we'll be recording this lecture for our archives, and pending permission from the speaker, the recording will be available on our YouTube channel in a few weeks. And if needed, links to other resources mentioned during the talk will be posted to the web page for this event. Uh, I'll remind everybody that if you experience any lags in video or audio quality, I recommend turning your video off uh, and closing other programs or apps you may have open. And if that doesn't help, you can always try exiting the Zoom meeting and re-entering the session again using that original link on the event page. Okay, so uh, for the introduction, I am going to turn it over to Tiana Raymond, the Herbarium Collections Manager, who will introduce today's guest speaker. Thank you, Brooke. It is my immense pleasure to introduce a friend of the herbarium. Um, we're delighted to have you here today, Monica. So for the rest of you in the audience, um, Monica got her degree at Southern Arkansas University, um, had a stint interning with the Fort Worth Botanic Garden, I think back in 2015, working with Zad Gomez in, in maybe the Tinsley Garden. Um, but has now been with NEON, has been a lead, uh, dom is a lead domain botanist with the Southern Plains Division of the NEON program. Uh, Monica's worked for NEON for about six years now, and we are most delighted that uh, you're here to spend time with us today to tell us about what's going on. I, I, I think there were promises of, of telling me about a big tower. So, um, so we really look forward to it. Thank you for spending the time with us today and all the work you come to do in the herbarium and consult our collections. Thank you, that was such a kind introduction. Um, I guess I can just go ahead and share my screen then. All right, I assume. All right, hopefully everyone can see that. All right, nodding heads means yes. All right, let us begin. So as mentioned, my name is Monica Kelly. I am the domain botanist for the Southern Plains domain of the NEON program. Um, I am one of the 20 domain botanists that is employed by the NEON program. And um, we'll get into more of that later. Um, uh, today I'll be giving a presentation on NEON, its missions, goals, structure, research happening in and around NEON and the assignable assets program. Um, before we get started, I'd like to thank Logan Clements for her significant contributions to this presentation. She spent a large chunk of time gathering and creating the skeleton of this presentation, um, but recently she left NEON as of February of 2022 to pursue a graduate degree in New York, New York. So in addition to being one of our brilliant aquatic ecologists for D11, she was also our outreach liaison who absolutely killed it. Um, I'd also like to thank Kanan Sutton, who is here in this meeting. He is the other botanist at our domain and despite being near a year it honestly feels like he's been here for four to five years because of how much he's contributed to all the work that we've done here um, he's amazing and he's got a wonderful hairdo you can see him in the video all right um moving on so um i'm going to go over what neon is be approximately 10 minutes an overview of the neon four protocols um some flora data visualizations and case studies and followed by some time for questions um, this image here is actually the Central Plains Experimental Station in Colorado. And if you can see our little tower, our, one of our mini towers off in the distance there. We'll talk more about that shortly. Okay, um, so what is NEON? Uh, NEON stands for the National Ecological Observatory Network. NEON is a 30-year project that is funded by the National Science Foundation and currently managed by the Battelle Memorial Institute. NEON is designed to collect standardized data at field sites across the United States from Alaska to Florida plus Hawaii and Puerto Rico to help us better understand these ecosystems as they shift and change over time. NEON collects a massive amount of data between automated systems, field observations, and airborne remote, remote sensing technologies. NEON collects data that characterizes plants, animals, soils, nutrients, freshwater, and atmospheric conditions. 
One of the best parts about MEON though is that the data is all free and open. Since we're funded by the National Science Foundation, everything that we collect, all of our methods are available for anyone to use um, and review. Okay. The intention of MEON, so kind of what started this was um, natural systems are comprised of complex processes occurring over a range of scales from the intricate compositions of individual living cells to the dynamic interactions of the global ecosystem. The earth and its ecological processes are changing at unprecedented rates due to human activity. The effects of these changes are uncertain. So to address this and this uncertainty, the science, education, computing, and engineering communities provided input into NEON's design with the shared goal of creating a long-term ecological observatory that collects and provides a diverse suite of comparable and consistent ecological data of multiple spatial and temporal scales. The observatory is designed to measure the drivers of change and the ecological responses to change in the areas of biodiversity, biogeochemistry, ecohydrology, and infectious disease. All right, so how does NEON work? Um, NEON is, um, Statistically portioned, NEON statistically portioned the continental United States, Hawaii, and Puerto Rico into 20 ecoclimatic domains that represent distinct regions of vegetation, landforms, and ecosystem dynamics to capture the full range of U.S. ecological and climate diversity. So that equals 20 um, terrestrial core sites, 27 relocatable sites, 19 core aquatic and 15 relocatable aquatic sites. And all of those are housed within these 20 eco-climatic domains here that are represented. Um, cool. um, so within those 20 eco-climatic domains, NEON collects data. NEON collects data in two unique ways. First, NEON uses a combination of data collection methods that are spatially integrated within and across field sites. And then second, the data collection methods used are standardized across all of these sites to enable comparisons across the continent. Um, typically, NEON uses three data collection methods here, um, automated instrumentation, observational sampling, and airborne remote sensing. Um, automated instruments collect things in the terrestrial and the aquatic systems, and they collect across I'm sorry, 24 seven. Um, observational sampling is sampling conducted by field ecologists in both terrestrial and aquatic systems. And those vary by kind of what the season's like. A lot of sampling happens kind of at the peak green periods or in the summers more so, and then kind of dies down in the winter, depending on where your site is. For example, Texas's field sampling season is basically from February until December, where Alaska is only for four to two months, I believe, in the summer. Okay. Um, and then last but not least is our airborne remote sensing, commonly referred to as AOP. Airplanes equipped with a high resolution camera, hypo spectrometers, and LIDAR systems fly over sites near pink greenness to monitor land cover characteristics. For this presentation, I'm mainly going to be focusing on the observational side and specifically the flora, but um, this information is available on the NEON website if you're interested more, and we'll touch briefly on it. All right, so these are um, example of the automated instrumentation systems. These are just a small subsection of all of the sensors that we have out there. Some of the cooler ones are presented here. Um, NEON deploys automated instruments to collect meteor meteorological <laughs> soil, phenological surface water. Oh my goodness, I'm so sorry. It collects meteorological soil, phenology, surface water and groundwater data at NEON field sites. So it's a blender. Um, combined with NEON's observational sampling data and airborne remote sensing data surveys, this instrumentation data provides an unprecedented opportunity to study ecosystem level change over time. Where it logistically possible, NEON co-locates aquatic sites with terrestrial sites to support understanding of linkage across the atmospherical, atmosphere, terrestrial and aquatic ecosystems. So for the observational systems, we focus on sentinel taxa, which are indicators of ecosystem health. Um, NEON sampling focuses on sentinel tax taxa, which are sensitive organisms that indicate the health of an ecosystem and provide data relevant to public health. Changing community dynamics of taxa affect ecological processes, such as disease transmission, rates, agricultural pest control, and ecosystem structure and function. Um, the 
selection criteria for these include wide geographical distribution for standardized sampling, uh, varied life histories, including lifespans and reproductive rates that affect the rates of responses to drivers such as climate change, um, phylogenetic diversity, and relevance of infectious ecology. Um, this is the airborne remote sensing, and we'll just touch briefly on this one. But AOP employs small aircrafts outfitted with hyperspectral and imaging spectrometer and waveform LIDAR and high resolution camera to fly annually over most NEON sites. These airborne instruments provide high resolution data sets on bed structure and canopy reflectance, the later of which can be used to understand canopy chemical compositions combined with plot based ground data. The AOP is critical to enabling end users to quantify biomass, productivity, and LEI at the site scale. All right, and so Southern Plains is the domain that Kate and I work out of. Um, so I'll just give a brief touch on those sites that we observe, and it's mainly in Texas and Oklahoma. Um, again, this is just the map, and our domain is highlighted here. We are the Southern Plains. Our field sites, you can see their little blob lips here touch a little bit more on them next. Um, so these are just some pictures of our field sites. Um, so the very first one is CLBJ, which stands for the Lyndon B. Johnson National Grasslands, or CLBJ. It's approximately 20,000 acres. Um, it's in Texas. Um, it's associated aquatic site is here, the Pringle Creek. Pringle Creek is a part of the CLBJ grasslands. It's just a shot across the way. Um, and then for our Oklahoma sites, which are relocatable sites, is going to be OES, which is the Marvin Clemmy Range Research Station um, at the Oklahoma Agricultural Experimental Station, our OES. It's managed by Oklahoma State, the Agricultural Division, and it's approximately 1,500 acres. Um, next up is the Blue River, which is in Oklahoma and is part of the Nature Conservancy property. It is approximately 3,600 acres. All right, so our core terrestrial site is the Lyndon B. Johnson Grasslands, our CLBJ. It's a terrestrial field site located at the Great Plains region of the North Central Texas. It's about 50 kilometers or 30 miles northwest of Denton. CLBJ occupies approximately 20,000 acres of public land, which is managed by the U.S. Forest Service. Neon samples in about 10,000 of those acres. The site has fairly flat terrain and consists of a mosaic or oak-dominated forest and grasslands. Um, if you have an opportunity to visit, I highly recommend it. I know Bob O'Kennan has certainly been out there. Um, it's a beautiful site full of beautiful plants and wonderful things. Um, you'll run into a lot of hunters and people riding on horseback, which for the most part have been fairly friendly. Slightly annoyed at us are the hunters, but for the most part, still happy. All right, so now for this section, I'll jump into our NEA, Neon Flora Protocols. All right. So this is an overview of all of the floor protocols that we typically do. A majority of these are completed on an annual basis, while some occur only once every five years, but every five years. Um, typically the five-year protocols, when they are done, are grouped and completed together. And those are sorted into two categories. We have the biogeochemistry and the plant biomass. Um, one of the reasons that we do them every five years is really to save money and also a lot of these um, processes that we're observing and recording, um, if we record every five years or annually, the data seems to be somewhat similar and we just save a little bit of money by completing them every five years instead of annually and we still get a really hardy data set. All right. So um, one of the most popular protocols that we do is called plant diversity. The purpose of plant diversity is to provide an understanding of changes in composition, distribution, and abundance of native and non-native plant species. This is comparable within and across NEON sites and other continental plant diversity efforts. Um, the goal is really to understand the impacts of drivers of change on the diversity of plant species and functional role in the ecological systems. So for our method, there are plants I identified in approximately 30 plots and their 20 by 20 meters are about 400 meters squared annually. Um, species and variable presence cover data is collected for one meter squared nested subplots, which you can see in this little image here. 
These are these little red boxes is where we collect the most high level um, density of sampling. Um, I guess I should mention too. So this box here, it shows this outer blue one. Those are our outer portions of the uh, plot. And that's where we do like destructive sampling. So if we needed to collect a plant or anything, we would get it from there. In addition to other sampling, such as like beetle collection, our soils are completed on this outer blue part and not within this inner 20. This inner 20 is reserved specifically for plant diversity sampling. So if we do any of those collections, we're not impacting the plant species populations within it. We're simply observing them inside of that box and not ripping them out essentially to ruin anything. Um, okay. Um, additional sampling that happens within plant diversity is um, we get archive vouchers. So we collect about 20 species um, that we're given a list of the most popular or most dominant ones that we see and we collect them and send them off to the bio repository in Arizona State, I believe. And so we collect every 20 years from each of our sites. So approximately 40 species for um, each year from D11 because we survey CLBJ and OES. And we also do genetic foliar tissue, which is 30 samples from 10 of the most dominant species that we have every five years. And I guess another thing is we do intense sampling in these real little red squares. And so that's taking a percent cover of how much plants are there and how much of like say lichen or soil or anything like that exists there. And then after we've completed that, we've surveyed everything in the red, we bump up into these little blue boxes. And the only thing we're looking for in these blue boxes, if there's any additional species that we see, and we're not looking for percent values or how much take up the area, we're only looking for species. And then once we've completed that, we run to this other box here, we complete in there, and then we do an entire survey where we just walk this square to catch any brand new species we come into. Okay. I think that's it for this one. All right, and this just shows it live. These are actually our field technicians here at D11. We have Kanan here, Julie, I think this might be Eric, and this is Christine. They're these three are seasonal staff and they're wonderful and delightful. And they're focusing on those little inner one by one where they're getting percentage values. <laughs> and this next slide here, actually, this is our Oklahoma site. There was a drone that came out in like 2018 where they just wanted to get some cool photos. This shows a plot delineated in its full entirety and where the surveying is happening. So here's this little one by one that's being sampled by our previous domain botanist, Jarrett. And then I'm serving sampling the inner square in the middle. Okay. So it's plant diversity. Um, next up is plant phenology. Um, so this one is to record seasonal progression of critical biological processes and timing of ecological events, such as initial growth, flowering, senescence, et cetera. Um, this is track indicators of biotic responses to climate variability by recording slash monitoring phenological stages in plant communities and to understand the impacts of changing forces such as temperature, timing, and duration of pest infestation and disease outbreak, water fluxes, nutrient budget, carbon sequestration, and food availability. Our sampling methods involve um, monitoring these individuals at some schedule determined by kind of um, when plants are going to be most active. Our site, we're basically sampling all season long. So we observe phenology every single week for the entire year which is super fun, it is, um, but it's a lot. Um, so this is split into two phases. Phase one is supposed to be at the beginning of the observatory. We're observing the three most dominant species. For our site, um, that's going to be post oak, Quercus stellata, yellow blue stem, which is Bothria chloris scamum, little blue stem, which is Schizocarium scoparium. And so we observe um, those three individuals, I'm sorry, those three species and at 30 individuals equivalent, equaling about 90 individuals we're observing each week. Um, and during the beginning of the observatory, which is about three seasons of observations, then you switch to phase two. And that's what we're working on now. We're going to observe 100 individuals and five of each of 20 common species. And so right now we're in the mix and that's why we were most recently um, abusing your herbarium recently to observe those species just trying to get a good eye of what we're looking for so that we are continuously observing these individuals and not accidentally observing its brother. And then when it flowers, we're like, oh, that's not the same one. We have to do some data quality pivots there. Anyway, um, the other thing that's associated with our 
phenology observation is the phenocam that is mounted on the instrument flux towers. It does continuous monitoring of certain individuals based on what we are looking for at our sites. All right, um, next up is litter fall and fine woody debris. Um, the purpose of this is to quantify product reduction of litter fall and fine woody debris is required to estimate annual above ground net primary productivity at a plot site and continental scales. This provides essential data for understanding vegetative carbon fluxes over time. Um, so for the method, litter is collected from elevated mess traps throughout the year and it's sorted into functional groups, leaves, needles, seeds, flowers, twigs, etc. Collection from ground traps happens once a year and that's for larger particles, leaves greater than um, 50 centimeters long and twigs greater than 50 centimeters long and less than two centimeters in diameter. Uh, Biogeochemistry happens every five years and samples are taken from one bout, high productivity, leaf and needle functional groups as well. Um, in these pictures here, you can see we have to remove our traps if there's a potential burning. Um, if there wasn't going to be burning, we would essentially leave these traps out for the entire 30 years um, and just collect the, content, the contents of the traps. Um, but we have to remove them for fires. And so we have one of our very strongest techs here, Cody Watson, just chugging them all through the field like a baller. Um, and then these are some of the collections that we do. Someone's collecting actively in the field. And then this is just a little segment of what sorting kind of looks like. All right. Um, next up is herbaceous biomass production. Um, so the purpose for this one is the net primary productivity, productivity NPP of this plant of plant groups can contribute significantly to total NPP, even in forest ecosystems. So understanding long-term trends in the herbaceous community structure and biomass is very important in graze ecosystems, where these plants constitute a critical food source for wildlife and livestock. In addition, members of the herbaceous plant community can respond relatively rapidly to various global changes. All right, so for methods, a standard practice for herbaceous biomass and productivity, this is assessed via clip harvest during peak biomass, are at a greater frequency if grazing is actively happening. Um, so our sites are pretty much grazing year round. So we are doing this process just about every four weeks, which is super fun, but it's only when cattle are there and things are actually grazing and it is a fairly nice protocol. Um, you're out there cutting grass with scissors. Uh, so after you, collect in the field, you bring it back into the lab. This is, you sort there and you're trying to sort out current year's growth from the previous year's growth as we're only interested in what has actively been growing this year. Um, after current year has been sorted out, then we'll sort it into additional categories based on the plant functional traits, such as cool season versus warm season graminoids, legumes versus non-legume forms, and et cetera. Um, this is in order to engender cross community compatibility with existing research. We sort clip biomass into functional categories that are broadly similar to those employed by the Global Nutrient Network Research Group. And it is co-located co below ground biomass core samples also occur every five year in similar areas. And this is a picture live from the field. I guess not live, these are our teammates. All right, next up is leaf area index. Uh, leaf area index is a useful proxy variable for numerous other variables of ecological interest, including plant biomass, plant productivity, forage quality, carbon balance, ecosystem energy flux, plant diversity, and the heterogeneity of plant cover. LEI is also used widely as a key input variable to model for models that seek to predict ecological processes such as carbon cycling. Um, regional to continental scale estimates of LEI are typically de derived from satellite data, but validation of satellite data with aircraft and ground collection data is relatively uncommon. By leveraging NEON's aircraft and ground collection estimates of LEI, it is possible to develop ground validated estimates of LEI at a continental scale. As for method, um, we take digital hemispherical photos, DHP for short, AKA a fish eye lens. Um, three tower plots are sampled annually. It's the same points and plots are sampled throughout the season at every two weeks. 
Upward is taken only if there's overstory and downward photos are taken just about all of the time. Um, and every five years, we will do distributed base plot sampled once during peak green and associated with an AOP flyover. Uh, bench structure. This is one of our most complicated protocols, but also one of my favorites. Um, this is the measurement of vegetation structure and the mapping of freestanding woody stems within our terrestrial observatory systems, our TOS plots. Uh, it enables calculations of per stem per plot and site level woody biomass and productivity. Um, within tower plots, woody biomass increment is often a dominant component of total above ground net primary productivity. Understanding the changes in woody biomass stocks and fluxes is therefore an important prerequisite for predicting ecosystem carbon balance. Recording the types and stature of woody species also provides insight into habitat quality and ecosystem responses to environmental change. Get, get ahead of myself there. It's just more to read. Um, vegetation structure data are also important complement to data streams generated by our airborne observational platform, AOP. When combined with AOP data, these ground collected data will validate LIDAR data used to map the structural complexity of vegetation and will enable mapping of plant biomass at a site scale. In conjunction with carbon flux data from our terrestrial instrumentation systems are the flux towers. Vegetation struct data will facilitate understanding how biomasses in different plant growth forms contribute to ecosystem level carbon flux. So for the method, uh, we generate data describing the spatial location, structure, volume, and biomass of the woody stem plant community, including tree, sampling, shrub, liana, and other growth forms. Data are collected with handheld tools in the field using methods with a long substantiated history in the forestry community. Uh, tower plots are measured annually, whereas distributed plots are measured every five years. Um, another protocol we have is below ground biomass. Um, below ground biomass represents a substantial component of the total plant biomass and plant carbon in terrestrial ecosystems. Yet below ground biomass stocks and turnover remain very poorly understood both in space and in time. Um, developing a better understanding of below ground plant biomass as well as how much of that biomass is produced and decomposed within a given year is therefore crucial to improving our understanding of how terrestrial ecosystems respond to environmental changes. So for the method, this protocol only happens once every five years. There are two cores slash monoliths taken at random locations, co-located herbaceous clip and tower plots. Um, samples are sieved and fine roots are sorted into size categories. So root fragments, anything that's less than one centimeter in length are accounted for for in a dilution subsampling. Samples are then dried, weighed, and a subset ground for chemical analysis for carbon and nitrogen, lignin, our archive, and for archiving, excuse me. All right, another protocol is coarse downed wood. The purpose of this one is to monitor stocks of coarse downed wood, our CDW, is important because CDW uniquely influences ecosystem function. In terms of ecosystem services, CDW provides habitat for wildlife, stabilizes soil, increases microenvironment heterogeneity, um, stores carbon and nutrient over decades, and can enhance seedling germination for trees and other plants. Uh, because coarse down wood particles can persist in the environment for decades to centuries, these particles have afterlife effects on ecosystem function of similar magnitude to those of live trees. In addition, knowledge about the quantity and size distribution of CDW particles or pieces at a landscape scale can be used to model the probability of fire occurrence and severity because of CDW can be an important fuel source. Um, so two components of CDW, we have volume and bulk density. Um, volume uses a line intercept distance sampling or LIDS. Uh, it's a log tally transects with probability proportional to volume length of transect increases for large volume logs. And then bulk density, which we're currently in the middle of, is cutting logs cross-sectional disk to determine mass and volume. Tax ID, DK class dimensions um, are observed with tally and targeted with bulk density sampling and once every five years. 
Right now, bulk density is supposed to only happen twice in the entire life of the observatory for each of our sites. And currently we're on our very first sampling. Really, Kanan's been leading that, leading that effort very well with the chainsaw. I can barely lift the chainsaw. Okay, um, canopy foliage chem chemistry. Um, the purpose of this is NEON quantifies changes in foliar chemical and structural properties over space and time, as these are commonly associated with key ecological processes, including productivity, decom oh, decomposition, and herbivory. Similarly, similarly oh my goodness, <laughs> NEON measures the isotopic composition of leaves, as well as leaf litter, roots, and soils thus enabling end users to follow um, changes in ecosystem carbon and nitrogen cycles. Uh, plant carbon and nutrient data are generated in collaboration with the Airborne Observation Platform, or AOP, which is largely responsible for mapping plant chemical and physical characteristics across the observatory using hyperspectral and LIDAR measurements. Our ground-based foliar data will be used to ground truth and validate AOP measurements. Such data can help the ecological research community refine algorithms to map canopy constitutions using hypospectral data. Additionally, foliar data informs species and site level estimates of canopy chemical constitution and how these changes can occur over time. Um, foliar chemistry data can also provide scientists, managers, and decision makers with important information on ecosystem nutrient status. Comparing these data with those from our ecosystem components, including atmospheric deposition, soils, leaf litter, and surface water allow investigators to evaluate material fluxes across the landscape. For method, um, samples are collected from each species found in site level sunlit canopy, um, replicates for common species. Digital crown polygons are created for woody individuals and herbaceous clip strips are collected in significant open non-woody area. Subsamples from this include chlorophyll, leaf mass per area, or LMA, bulk, carbon and nitrogen, lignin, and archive samples. Um, this one's fun is some sites have trees that are so large they actually have to use rifles to get those trees down from the high canopies. They also can use drones or sharpshooters. Luckily our trees are pretty short, we just have a very long grim reaper type of device. All right, and so those are the typical floor protocols with the potential to add more depending on if the community decides that more might be needed or to maybe modify these in some way as they go through time. So research being done with neon flora data. So for this one, plant leaf out in fall, coloration modeled from natural national data sets, goodness. Uh, this research group outlined a new approach for analyzing phenology observations across a broad array of ecosystem species. The objective of their work was to develop a multi-region, multi-species model on the onset of spring, so leaf out in fall, leaf coloration for over 100 plant species within 15 temperate ecoregions of the U.S. They used a nine-year data set of observations from the National Phenology Network and a four-year data set from the NEON, from NEON to quantify variation between species and regions in, sens in sensitivity to environmental drivers for both spring and fall leaf phenophases. They were able to create a good model for predicting this variation. If you look on the model here, you can see the model predicted for values versus the on-ground observation dates spring leaf out for 128 species, that's panel A, and for fall leaf coloration for about 112 species, that's panel B. Um, perfect predictions would fall along the one-to-one -one line. Most of the data fall along the one-to-one -one black line, showing that the model accurately predicts leaf out and leaf coloration. And the red is the 95% confidence interval. Just one study. Um, another one here is the figure on the, this is for, sorry, plant leaf out and fall coloration still. Um, the figure on the left shows you what the model predicts for the mean sensitives among species and regions of deciduous trees and shrubs, phenology to environmental drivers. Uh, panel A is spring leaf out and B is fall leaf coloration. Um, they show the, es the estimated mean sensitivity, so plus 95% C 
HCI for each environmental driver, plus the baseline hazard rate intercept. Uh, positive coefficients indicate climate forcing variables that prolong the initial state, i.e. leafless state for spring and green leaved state for fall, and therefore delay the onset of the phenological transition. This figure is telling us that the model predicts that spring leaf out, panel A, was generally promoted by longer days, spring growing de degree day acclimation, overwinter chilling, and was suppressed by frost events, whereas fall leaf color was prom promoted by shorter days and cold accumulation. Uh, the figure on the right shows the sensitivity of spring leaf out to GDD for each species. Uh, point estimates are plus 95% CI of each GDD species. A negative parameter estimates reflect species where GDD accelerates spring leaf out. We can see that this varies by species. Overall, this study showed we can use citizen science and a national scale monitoring phenology data uh, to develop accurate models of plant phenology. This is important because these kind of models are normally limited by the intensive phenological monitoring efforts required to generate sufficient data to parameterize each model. And NEON provides an immense amount of this data for free. Um, so another study that was done is relatedness, spatial scale, and climate play important roles in biological invasions. Uh, this research group used NEON plant data to explore two famous contradictory hypotheses regarding factors influencing the outcome of biological invasions of non-native species. First, that non-native species closely related to native species would be more likely to successfully establish because they might share adaptions to the local environment. And then conversely, second, the lack of competitive exclusions would facilitate the establishment of alien invaders genetically distinct from the native flora. Mm -hmm. To date, no consensus has been reached regarding these opposing hypothesis, hypotheses. Specifically, this research group used plant data from NEON and the US Forest Service data set to examine patterns of taxonomic and phylogenetic relatedness between native and non-native taxa across thousands of locations, ranging in size and extent from local to regional scales. They also looked at how temperature and precipitation affect biological invasions. The figure shows that data they used from across the US. Blue circles represent the FIA plots and orange diamonds represent NEON plots. Red triangles at right indicate country mean climatic values. All right, so their results show that the presence of native species closely related to invasive species is more likely to predict invasive invasion success at larger spatial extents and in harsher climates. All of the boxes, so A3 in the figure on the top left, show you the relationship between the relatedness of invasive species and native species and spatial scale. For box A, we can see that the expected number of invasive species with the same genus as native species, otherwise called cogeners, and a plot increase with scale. Box B and C show that the same relationship, only comparing number of expected species with a plot area, box B, and a county area, box C, Box D and E show that the probability of observing greater than random standardized numbers of invasive species with native cogeners increases with plot area and county area. The bottom left figure shows the inverse relationships because they are comparing mean phylogenetic distance to the number of invasive species present. A greater mean phylogenetic distance would mean invasive and native species would be less related. Boxes A and B in the figure on the right show that mean phylogenetic distance, so less related, tended to increase with temperature and precipitation at local scales. So we see unrelatedness increasing with increasing temperatures and precipitation. Warmer weather environments tend to support more species and are less harsh, leading to more competition. Whereas regional scales, unrelatedness decrease in response to increasing climatic variation. So we see relatedness decreasing with increased climate, climatic variation. Drier, colder environments that vary more are more harsh and support less species leading to less competition. Um, more info, info in case there are more questions is plot annual temperature A, plot annual precipitation B, the SD of mean annual temperature across each county C, 
and SD of annual precipitation across each county is D. Shaded areas represent 95% CIs. So what does all this mean? They found that hypothesis one, first, the non-native species closely related to native species would be more likely to successfully establish because they might share adaptive to their local environment. Happens at a larger scale, scale and in harsh environments. This is likely the case because coexisting species need similar traits to survive lar larger, harsher environments. Whereas hypothesis two, which focuses on competition among related species, happens at a smaller slash local scale in less harsh environments. This is likely because at smaller local spatial scales, density dependent mechanisms associated with limiting similarities such as competition and enemy escape slash resistance become more important as the environment is generally homogeneous at local scales. Individuals are more likely to interact directly and compete over the same pool of limited resources, and thus they may be little, little. Oh, they may be limit to the similarity of competing species that can coexist. All right, and then I believe this is our last neon example, but this is small mammal diversity modeling. So this researcher was a PhD student at Humboldt State University. They examined whether LIDAR data could be used to predict small mammal diversity and whether structural diversity is related to small mammal diversity. She used small mammal counts from our small mammal sampling protocol and LIDAR data from our AOP planes from three NEON sites in northern Wisconsin. You can see the sites here on this um, figure. She collected data uh, to examine structural diversity, she used LADAR derived variables like canopy cover and canopy complexity. All right, so the figure on the right shows LIDAR data displaying the difference in structural diversity of plots at the three different forested sites. The bottom plot has the least forest structural diversity. So picture a forest with just one or two species all around the same height. That's why it's practically all one color. The top has the most structural diversity. So picture a forest with multiple tree species with different heights and gaps in the canopy. The top square has a lot of color, which is showing you that there are gaps in the canopy and multiple height layers of vegetation. If you look at the figure on the left, you can see the relationship between small mammal diversity and forest structural diversity. Here we can see that the small mammal diversity increases with forest structural diversity. Thus the data shows that structural diversity of vegetation is correlated with higher diversity in small mammal populations. Um, all of this and more, any of the data that's been done can be found at the Neon Zotero Library to review the full scope of research that has been published using our Neon protocols, assignable assets, and data. Um, as for D11, there have been a handful of people that have reached out to use our data um, I don't have any specific examples at this point yet because they haven't been released. Um, it just seems like we've recently got a little bit more popular, but I'm excited to hopefully have more of those in the future and maybe one day have time to also actually review the data myself, a little bit more involved, um, but maybe. Um, but we do have a few. Um, so right now, this is really just species um, diversity that's being represented here. So the graph shows the average number of unique species per plot across 10,600 observations averaged by NLCD class. The average number of unique species per plot across the observations for each plot are the background gray dots. It shows 33 plots for two NLCD classes averaged over again this 10,000 observations. Um, so this includes a 95% confidence intervals. The means are 39.8 for deciduous forest and 52.0 for grassland herbaceous. And this is over four field seasons, so about 2016 to 2019, and this is for our CLBJ. Um, so uh, the graph, so really what this is showing is that we have more diversity within our um, CLBJ sites within the grassland than we do within the deciduous forest, which kind of makes sense. We are a bit more of a prairie site, and we've just, it's kind of the area that grow and a lot of our trees just outshade things and it just kind of limits the diversity that's there. It's really so far all I have for COPD specifically, but that is a nice segue into the Assignable Assets Program. Um, so NEON has the Assignable Assets Program. 
uh, it makes available certain components of NEON's infrastructure to members of the community to support their research or other activities. Um, field sampling support and coordination. They fly non-NEON sites with AOP. They can add sensors to our NEON infrastructure. There's also a mobile deployment platform, which is basically the tower. All of this infrastructure just sized down and can be wheeled out to your site if you'd like to add that sampling to your research. Um, we also can collect excess samples. And I will say that we are more than happy to accommodate those. It's actually quite a thrill to work with outside researchers and try to help them implement their research and to kind of buddy up with what we're doing. It's actually a thrill. Everyone, when we have them, we're kind of excited for it. It's a little bit of a party. Um, a couple of the research that's being done or assignable assets is being done, and this is just one of few. Um, we have the Atkins SAP flow sensors and soil collection. Um, this was an installation of SAP flow sensors in 15 trees and across to access, I'm so sorry. They installed SAP flow sensors in 15 trees around our towers, our Plux tower systems. Uh, they use our infrastructure to power those and to also power something to basically send all the data from those trees to their computers. Um, they used high frequency water vapor isotopic measurements as a novel method to partition daily Evo transpiration in an oak woodland. Butchered that, but tried. All right, um, the other one that we did was the Chandri. Um, by using a NEON's assignable asset program, her work was able to get basically a survey of the aerial spores dispersal. Um, she has them at our site and also across all of the 20 core terrestrial sites. And so she's been looking at those. And we go out there kind of regularly as we're just walking through there to check to make sure that those things are still up and running and haven't been melted in a fire. And once or twice a year, we'll go through and we'll collect these canisters and ship them off to her. And she'll share what she's um, basically collected from her fungal spores with us and also for the paper she's writing. But we have annual paloozas. So for some of those, she'll join and say, hey, we found all these cool spores. Do you guys want to see pictures? And absolutely. Um, but that data can be found and there's, I'll provide a link to it too if you'd want to read more about what she does. Um, and then last but not least is Compson. This is more for our aquatic sites that do this, um, but it's a recently developed assignable asset. It happens at 18 neon aquatic sites. Uh, leaf litters are packed, leaf litter packed replicates, each containing a different species of leaf litter from sycamore, ash, and cottonwood. And they're labeled with non-radioactive isotopes and deployed into neon weightable streams. Packs are left in the stream for approximately one month to allow for invertebrate colonization and isotopic signatures uptake, after which they will be retrieved and frozen prior to analysis. At the PI's lab, aquatic micro-introverts are removed from the leaf packs, identified and prepared for stable isotope analysis. Once stable isotope analysis is completed, isotopic mixing models will be conducted in R to determine the flow of carbon and nitrogen through the aquatic food webs in each stream. Um, using existing NEON stream data, the controls on carbon and nitrogen fluxes will be determined and used to create food web models to make predictions about these fluxes for our systems. All right, and that is the end of my presentation.